Good morning, church. It's good to be with you live this morning, and we're so excited to lead you in worship. So wherever you're at in your homes, if you're in the car, just sing a little louder for the people outside the car to hear you. But uh, if you would, join us in singing Holy, Holy, Holy. Welcome to Stewart Congregational Church, and we are coming to you today live from the chapel. How exciting is that? Now, if you are watching on Facebook or on YouTube, you can go to stewartchurch.live for a more interactive experience. So you can join us at stewartchurch.live right now for an interactive experience. Now, we have a few things going on next week that I'm sure you already know about. Next Sunday, November 1st, we will be live again, but this time live in person. That's right, live in person for our sunshine service. We'll be outside in the parking lot, and we ask that you RSVP and join us because we would love to see you in person here at the church, live. But we will also be showing it on stewartchurch.live, so if you don't feel comfortable coming out, or if it rains like it did was supposed to do this morning, you can still attend. So we want to make sure everybody can still attend church. And also next Sunday and Monday, we are having a food drive. So if you're coming out to this, the sunshine service, you can bring some food for our food drive, or you can bring it on Monday. Now, we have a lot of events going on in the church. We have Bible studies almost every day of the week. You can go to uh, steward.church to find out more information on the various Bible studies that we have every week. We are also having this Wednesday at 6 p.m. a pumpkin carving and costume parade. This is an event for everybody, for kids, for adults. Even if you don't have kids, you could still come and join us for this really fun event. Invite your neighbors. If you would like to come to this, let us know because we will be providing the pumpkins and the materials to carve. So you can contact Mark at steward.church 
or go to our website and get more information on how to let us know that you will be coming. If you have a prayer request, you can email us at prayers at, prayers at stuart.church and one of our ministers will respond and get back to you because we would love to hear prayer requests that you have and we would love to be able to pray with you. With that said, we do have Stephen ministers available. If you are going through a season in life that you need somebody to walk with you, or if you are experiencing pandemic fatigue, or whatever you are experiencing in life, we have Stephen ministers that would absolutely love to be able to walk with you and pray with you during this time. Now, the Word of God tells us to make a joyful noise. And what better way to make a joyful noise than to sing about God's amazing grace and his amazing love? So now crank up that volume and let's sing about God's amazing love and amazing grace together. Sing with me this morning. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, 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 who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations. With truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. The King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. Lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, 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 oh. Please 
bow your head and join me in a word of prayer. God, we just sang the truth that your grace is amazing, that your love is unfailing. God, may we never forget or lose sight of these truths. May we never take them for granted. When we follow in your steps, your grace is amazing and your love is unfailing. God, when we sin, when we fail, your love is unfailing and your grace is amazing. And God, we do confess that we have failed. God, we confess that we have sinned. But God, we know that when we ask for forgiveness, your grace is there to meet us. This amazing grace that you bestow on us. And so God, we thank you for that. That God, that when we act as we should not, when we speak as we should not, when we have not loved, God, you have grace on us and your love is unfailing. And so, God, we put our trust in this. And God, it seems so often right now with the state of our nation in election season that oftentimes we are speaking as we should not and loving as we should not. And so, God, we ask that where there is violence, replace it with peace. Where there is hatred, replace it with love. Where there is fear, replace it with joy. And, God, where there is division, replace it with unity. And, God, where there is anxiety, replace it with a calmness that only your Holy Spirit can give us. Help us to remember that no matter what happens in our lives, in our nation, in the upcoming election, that God, no matter what happens, you are still God, and no politics, no division, nothing can change that. You are still God of our lives, and help us to remember that as we look at our brothers and sisters. Help us to remember that you are God that we are one in you. Even when we are on opposite spectrums politically, opposite spectrums of life, God, that we are still one in you, and that is what matters above all else. Because, God, you are Lord of our life. And, God, right now we lift up and pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray because that is what we can pray with one voice coming together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture tells us that as far as the east is from the west, so far have our sins been cast from us. You are forgiven and free. Believe this today, my friends. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Good morning, friends. You know what faith is. Faith is a response to what God has first done to and for us. And so we praise God for that. We thank God for that. We give God our love, our devotion, our all. And, and in a moment like this in worship, offerings are an act of worship. And we want to invite you now to offer yourself and to offer your gifts to the Lord's work as a matter of gratitude 
as a matter of thanksgiving. And today you can do that very easily by simply going to stewart.church slash give. Stewart.church slash give. There you can find the give link and you can give online. You can be led to how to text to give. And of course, you can always mail something in and next week be with us in person and you can slip it in the offering box. Remember, we give back to God out of the abundance with which he has given us. Let us be those who give as an act of faith. Amen and amen. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawn. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy. strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. We come before you this morning, just we're here to worship you and worship you alone. Just as we sing about no matter what's going on in our lives, when we're having a bad week, we can still worship you. When we're having a good week, we want to worship you, Lord. In every situation in our lives, you deserve the honor and praise, and that's what we're here to do this morning. Lord, we continue to worship you right now, and I just uh, look forward to what Pastor Tim has to teach us this morning. 
And I just ask that you would open our ears to listen to what you have for us. And we pray this in your great name. Amen. All good things must come to an end. And so here we are, the last sermon in this very lengthy sermon series called Conversations with Jesus. What have we been doing? We've been walking through the Gospels and listening to, looking at, learning from conversations that Jesus has had with individuals in the Gospels when he walked this earth, real people and Jesus. And what he says to them, what he said to them, listen, one more time. It's what he says to you and what he says to me. So much value in tuning into these conversations. And today, the last conversation is between Jesus and specifically Peter, the rock. Uh, the, the Greek word for his name is Petra, which means the rock. Now, he was called the rock appropriately, but we also know that he was not always so rock solid, was he? He failed a lot. He put his foot in his mouth a lot. He specifically failed Jesus, denying him three times at the end of Jesus' journey on earth before being crucified. But listen to this. Peter's failure didn't define him. And Jesus speaks to Peter and his failure. And in speaking to Peter and his failure, guess what? He speaks to you and to me and our own personal failure. So let's listen in really closely to our Lord as he speaks to Peter and speaks to us. But first, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come like fire and burn. Come like wind and cleanse. Come like light and reveal. Convict, convert, consecrate us until we are holy and only yours. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Question for you. Why is it that failure so often feels like defeat. Remember, and especially if you're my age or older, uh, the wide world of sports, uh, the, the way that it opened every weekend with that scene that featured Vinko Bogatej. You know him. Well, you may not know his name, but you know him because it was that scene where he was competing in the 1970 uh, ski flying championship in Oberdorf, West Germany when he came off of the ski lift and he crashed and burned, falling on his head and tumbling down, and that was featured every single week in the opening scene with that music that accompanied it, talking about the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Well, it was the agony of defeat part that showed him crashing and burning every day. He was interviewed a little later about this scene and told that he, he didn't know this, that more than 130 times this was aired every single year. He was actually famous for his agony of defeat scene. That's what failure often feels like, doesn't it? The agony of defeat. But it doesn't, it doesn't have to. And so as we start out this topic, I want to I give some gospel thoughts on failure before we focus in on Peter himself. And the first one comes from the Apostle Paul and what he teaches us in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. This is what he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're starting with the bad news. Bad news, then good news. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here's what that means for you and for me and for all people. We, we all have failed at what's most important in life. You know what that is? A relationship with God. It's the story of Adam and Eve. It's the human story. Their story is our story. Our story is their story. You may succeed at a lot of things in life. A lot of you are succeeding right now in your vocation at work. You're proud of your family, your success in that. Maybe you have a home, maybe a career. You're successful perhaps at school or in academics, awards, accomplishments. Maybe you're successful in your marriage. Maybe you're successful with fame or influence or power. Maybe you're simply successful with having a comfortable lifestyle that you like. That's great. But here's the truth that's hard for all of us to swallow. You and I have failed at what's most important, a relationship with God. 
And that's why Francis Chan, he really gets our attention when he says this. Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that really don't matter. What matters most is a relationship with God, and we have failed at that. That's the bad news. And acknowledging your most epic failure is the first step toward healing, toward growing, toward learning, toward becoming who God wants you to become. Richard Rohr said, you cannot heal what you cannot acknowledge. And so we have to face that fact and acknowledge it. Then comes the good news, Romans 3, 24. Since all have fallen short, all have sinned. All are justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That's the good news. And here's what it means. It's safe to embrace your failure. You know why? Because the Lord, the God that you failed, embraces you. It's safe. In fact, we can own it proudly like a football coach who gave this advice about failure. He said, you know what? If, here's how you deal with failure. When you're about to run out of town, get out in front and make it look like you're heading the parade. <laughs> I love that. Because... We need to see our failure not through our eyes or the eyes of others, as a matter of fact, but through the eyes of Jesus. And he's much more concerned about who you are inside, what's happening inside, your transformation inside, than about the circumstances that have led to or been produced by any personal failure. Here's what J.R. Briggs says. Listen to this. He said, God is much more concerned about the transformation going on inside us and the circumstances going on around us. What do we do? We often get consumed with what's happened as a result of failure or what led to it, and that's not the point. We need to look at it as an opportunity to be transformed from the inside out. And this leads to the third thought, gospel thought on failure. This comes again from Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 he says but God said to me my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness and then Paul goes on to say this therefore I will listen to this I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that my power Christ's power may rest on me that is why for Christ's sake listen to this I will delight in my weaknesses I will delight in insults in hardships I will delight in persecutions and difficulties, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Would you like to be in a place where you can delight in hardship, difficulties, weaknesses, where you can delight in failure? You see, that's the security that comes with Jesus Christ in our failure. And here's what it means. Here's the promise, and write this down, because your best growth opportunities follow failure. Your best growth opportunities always follow failure. We can see this by analogy in different ways. You ever broken a bone? I broke this wrist one time, uh, and it was a bad, bad break. And what I've learned is that when your bone is broken, your bone fails you. Where the break happens, when it starts to heal, there's a collection of calcium deposits. And for a time, that break, where it's healing, is actually stronger, it's growing back stronger than the rest of the bone. You ever heard of the Chinese character? There's one character in the Chinese language that means both danger and opportunity. That's what failure can bring for us. We see this in individuals, people that we know and respect, and we're amazed to hear some of the stories like of, of Robert Frost, the famous poet in 1902. The Atlantic Monthly Magazine rejected his poetry and called it, they said, our magazine has no room for your vigorous verse. Wow. Or how about the famous Albert Einstein, whose dissertation was rejected by the University of Bern in 1905. They called it, listen to this, irrelevant and fanciful. Albert Einstein. Or the famous Winston Churchill in 1894. His school teacher wrote on his report card, a conspicuous lack of success. <laughs> They all learned from and grew from those failures, didn't they? How about Thomas Edison? In West Orange, New Jersey, his manufacturing facility where all of his famous experiments were being developed, burned to the ground. You know what his response was? This is it. He said, there is value in disaster. All our mistakes are burned up. Now we can start anew. 
Now we can start anew. That's what failure, that's the opportunity failure brings you and me. And that's why J.R. Briggs says failure is the crucible of character formation. It's the crucible of character formation. And that, my friends, is why failure does not have to feel like the agony of defeat. Let's look at Peter now and how he models this for us. We're looking at where Jesus appears to the disciples for the third time after his resurrection. The scene is the Sea of Galilee, a big lake. And the disciples, well, they've been with Jesus this, this whole ministry, and what they thought would happen didn't happen. It seemed like an utter failure. Jesus has been crucified. What do they do? They go back home, and they do what's familiar. They go fishing. They're professional fishermen. Here's what John says about this in John chapter 21, the first three verses. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to the disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. You see, they're professional fishermen. They know that you catch the most fish and the best fish at night. That's when they're biting. But they caught nothing, so it's morning time. And here they are. They have been, they feel like Jesus has failed them. They feel like they've been a, a failure overnight. And they're doing what's familiar, what's comfortable. The disciples let failure take them back to the familiar, which is comfortable, but listen, it's dangerous for your soul. It's dangerous for your soul. I'm reminded of the story of Sir John Franklin in 1845. He led an expedition of 138 men to the North Pole. They took several ships. They only had two weeks worth of coal in those ships for an expedition that was meant to last two to three years. Um, and the reason they couldn't take more coal is because of all the extraneous, unnecessary things that they took. They had a 1,200-volume library in their ships. They had lots of fine china, a hand organ. They had goblets, wine goblets, and sterling silver with the crests of all of their families in, engraved on them. All the stuff that took up valuable weight. They didn't take winter clothes that were appropriate. Well, as you might guess, the natives found 138 frozen corpses. And in the sleds, they found china and silver, a little chocolate, and a backgammon board. It's an amazing reminder, isn't it, that failure can leave you frozen, frozen with what's familiar instead of free to explore God's future for you. How did that work out for Peter? Well, let's see how it worked out as we continue reading this story as John tells us. It says early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, well, then throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Here they are, professional fishermen. They have struck out all night long. Jesus comes along. It's daytime. What does he know about fishing? <laughs> Stick your net on the other side, and they catch a lot of fish. What is Jesus illustrating here? Jesus is illustrating that following his will, listen, is always more fruitful was for them it is for you and me following his will is always more fruitful jesus shows up as their fishing guide now i am not a good fisherman anybody in my family can tell you that uh, we we lived on a house on the river and all i ever caught was catfish ugly catfish every single time i fish one time i went with a fishing guide and, and actually caught a red drum really delicious and edible fish all the differences made when you have a guide you know what our problem is? We want to be our own guide in life. We want to be our own guide. We like our side of the boat. We don't want to be told about the other side of the boat. In other words, we want it our way all the time, don't we? The disciples, 
they show us the way. They swallowed their professional fishing pride and they did what Jesus said and it worked out quite well for them. Then how does the story develop? Here's what John says. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus is cooking breakfast. I love it. He said, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them, as a matter of fact. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. Now, that last line, does that, does that lead your mind toward another story in the gospel? Bread and fish? Maybe you're thinking like I am about the feeding of the 5,000 with the bread and the fish. And if you're thinking like that, I think you should be. Because you see, in the story of the feeding of the 5,000 people, Jesus told the disciples, you go feed the people. He blessed it and multiplied it, but he told the disciples, you go feed them. Now, instead of feeding others in Jesus' name, what's happening? They're being fed by Jesus. Oh my gosh, we need to listen to this. We need to watch this. Listen to this conversation. Because since failure tends to find us, the best of us. Listen, we need to each learn to feed others in Jesus' name and be fed by Jesus. Both, not one or the other. Since failure finds the best of us, we need to learn to serve and use our spiritual gifts in Jesus' name as well as be fed by Jesus spiritually in personal devotion, in corporate Bible study with others, not one or the other. You see, we tend often to be either a contributor or a consumer, but we need both. We need to be given by Jesus and serve and give away in his name because the warning is this, one without the other leaves you either spiritually dehydrated or spiritually bloated. This conversation and the modeling of these disciples show us the way. Then what happens? Well, it says in verse 14, this, is, this was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Why is it mentioned the third time? Why is the number three seem to be occurring again and again? Jesus uh, raises after three days, right? Jesus appears three times. Jude, uh, uh, Peter denies Jesus three times. And as we'll see in a moment, Peter professes his love for Jesus three times. What's up with the number three? I'll tell you what's up with that. It reminds us of the opportunity of new life. New life comes from the failure of death and denial, burial and betrayal. New life came for Peter in the middle of death and denial, burial and and betrayal and that's the promise for you and me in our failure this is the gift of the gospel of jesus well how does it develop how, what does this look like for peter we hone in now on the very personal conversation between jesus and peter beginning with verse 15 in john 21 it says when they had finished eating jesus said to simon peter simon son of john do you love me more than these yes lord he said you know that i love you Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. A third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him for a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. What's going on here? Is Jesus hard of hearing? Does he stutter? What is going on here? You see, here's what I think is going on. Jesus affirms, or he allows Peter to affirm his love for him three times, symbolically canceling out the three times that he denied Jesus. 
The immediate takeaway for you and me is this. Failure is met with forgiveness and a new future. Jesus meets your failure and mine with forgiveness and a new future. And listen, here's exactly the way this works. And if you haven't written anything down, I, would, I, would, I have three thoughts that I'd want to encourage you to write down. Three ways Jesus redeems your failure and mine that we get from this story. The first way that Jesus redeems your failure and mine is this, by making you someone new. By making you someone new. You're a new creation. Failure is an event. It's not you. It's not your identity. Your identity is grounded securely in the God who created you and who redeemed you. Your identity is firmly grounded and safe and secure in Jesus Christ. But it's not just about you being made new and sitting fat and happy about it. You see, the second way that Jesus redeems your failure is to give you something redemptive to do. To give you something redemptive to do. If you get a new driver's license, let's say you're a, a 16-year-old boy and you get a new driver's license. You have a new ID card with a driver's license. Well, it doesn't mean a whole lot unless you get in the car and go somewhere. Actually do something with it. Drive somewhere. Go somewhere different. The same is the case for us. When we're given a new identity, we're also giving something redemptive to do. Don't go back to what's comfortable and familiar like they started to do. Ask Jesus where to throw your net. The net of your time, the net of your resources, your money, your skills, your passion, your experience, the net of your spiritual gifts. Where, Lord, will you have me throw it? So, Jesus redeems your failure by giving you a new identity, by giving you something redemptive to do, and then thirdly, he redeems your failure by using it to give hope to others. God never wants to waste your pain. It seems like such a waste, doesn't it? Like, why did this have to happen? Why did I have to go through that? Jesus never wastes a failure that is put in his hands. I love the way this is illustrated by J.R. Briggs who was a pastor speaking in a, prior ch a church that he had served years prior. He was preaching on Jeremiah, and the text where Jeremiah says, You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived by you. And he's shaking his fist at God. He feels betrayed by God. And in that moment when he's preaching, he's sharing the story about how he and his wife had felt betrayed by God like they had failed, and God had failed them because they were infertile. They couldn't have children. He's sharing this story in his sermon, and without his knowing it, there was a couple sitting in the congregation. And they had a personal story of failure, discouragement. You see, they had just found out that their daughter in college was pregnant. Well, they got an idea as they were driving home from church that day. They decided to make an appointment to see the pastor and his wife the following day. And as J.R. Briggs puts it, it was the first time we met with the birth family of our eldest son, Carter. You see, two families experiencing failure and brokenness and pain, God used it to bring hope and peace and healing and love for both families through adoption. As we reflect on what Jesus is saying to us, I want to ask you a few questions. And the first set of questions comes from someone else, Gene Edwards. He asks this, what does the world need? Now think about this, especially in this climate that we're in today. What does the world need? Gifted men and women outwardly empowered or individuals who are broken and inwardly transformed? What's your answer? I think the world needs individuals who are broken and inwardly transformed. Let me ask you, as we think about Peter and the model, the example that he is for us, what, what will you do? When you encounter this Lord who takes and redeems your failure in this way, what will you do? Will you jump out of the boat of your failure to reunite with Jesus like Peter? Will you, will you ask him which side of the boat his will is directing your time and energy, your life toward 
Will you respond with love to the love that Christ has for you? Will you give love away because of the love that Christ has for you? Remaking you, giving you something redemptive to do, and bringing hope into the lives of others. Do you love Jesus more than any other? You see, that's, that's the final question that Jesus landed on with Peter in our last conversation. Do you love me more than these? He asked Peter. Now, what are the these that he's referring to? It's interesting because scholars think that it, he could have been referring to the, the fishing lifestyle. There they are. He's just been fishing. There are boats, there are nets, there's fishing gear. Uh, Simon Peter, do you love me more than this lifestyle that is so familiar and comfortable that you love so much? Listen, that preaches to us, doesn't it? A lot of times our lifestyles are really our God. Some scholars think that Jesus was referring to uh, the disciples, the other disciples. Peter, do you love me more than you love them, your buddies you grew up with, your friends? And, and that's a challenge for us, isn't it? Because a lot of times our real devotion is toward the people in our lives more than the God who gives us life. But most scholars think it refers to this. Peter, do you love me more than they love me it's a competition of who's going to love the most and so Jesus' challenge to Peter and listen his challenge to you and me is this to out love others to out love others to love others out of the love Jesus has for you to love Jesus by loving others to love others and serve Jesus through doing that you know what he offers you in exchange freedom freedom as J.R. Briggs one last time says, true freedom in Christ is when we have nothing to hide, nothing to lose, and nothing to prove. Let me say it again. True freedom in Christ is when we have nothing to hide, nothing to lose, and nothing to prove. My friend, divine love, that kind of divine love, is what redeems your failure. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord God, we are humbled and thankful that you love us so unconditionally that we can acknowledge our failure and that you see it, that we have betrayed you, our first love, the most important thing in life. And despite that, you call out to us. You give us a new identity. You give us something redemptive to do with our lives, even with our failure. And you want to use us to bring hope to others. Thank you. Your love is so great. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. To you be all the honor and glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, in darkness tries to at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God all will see how great how great is our God
I cannot wait to welcome you here on campus next Sunday. I hope you're planning for it. You need to know that it is an RSVP system. We need you right now, right now, if you're hearing me, if you're watching this, right now to reserve your spot so that we can anticipate your coming. And we're doing this so that we can keep you safe in case anything were to happen with new contact tracing. We also know how many people to expect to spread you out. We're going to have social distancing. We'll have masks available. We'll have hand sanitizers. We're going to have contactless offering all the things that we need to keep you safe but so that we can gather together once again as a family of faith in person on campus. I was having a conversation with Tom Moore who showed up this morning and and he said, you know what, nothing, nothing replaces being in person in worship. No matter how good it is, what we produce on TV, there's nothing like being together in the family of faith. And he's so right. Plan to join us next week. It's going to be a fantastic reunion as we come back together as the family of faith and worship here on the campus outside at 9 a.m. next Sunday, November the 1st. And as always, we want to remind you that if you have a challenge in your life and you need someone to walk with you, to encourage you, to pray for you, to support you, we have Stephen Ministers available. All you need to do is reach out to me through Tim at Stuart.Church. Tim at Stuart.Church. Anyone in your family, in your neighborhood, friends, colleagues, it's a ministry that's available to everyone and it's free. Please don't hesitate to reach out. And I hope to see you with us next Sunday. In the meantime, my friends, remember this. Whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you and be gracious to you. May the light of the Lord's countenance shine upon your face and give you peace. Go now in peace. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen and amen. How great is our God.